Uh, welcome to the talk about Ethernet VPN by Scorpy. Hello. Um, I'm going to talk today about eVPN and why you maybe want this. Um, I'm Scorpy. I'm doing infrastructure befreifung for a few years, doing this also as my day job. As a background, I run large access networks, for example, for Freifunk, and also do network and infra for servers and infrastructure. Um, Freifunk has low budget, and um, at a job, we have a totally different game and can invest there in complex server and, and router infrastructure and run their Juniper hardware with Cumulux for EVPN. And I'll tell you some stuff about this today. Um, today, or nowadays, we don't run the classic OZ layers anymore. We have layers in between. Um, this is what the network provider sees as a, when they log into the network stack as the OZ layers. Uh, we run, for example, eVPN with um, VXLAN or with MPLS or segment routing and have different encapsulation in this stack. Problems with yeah, plain air two networks, they're easy to deploy, just put a switch now in the rack or in the desk and have network connectivity there. And um, for VLANs or for scaling, I can use VLANs and maybe Q and Q, so VLANs and VLANs. Um, I have the problem that every unknown traffic or broadcast or multicast traffic is forwarded to all switch ports. And this is an, can be an attack vector and also yeah, has scaling issues. Um, another drawback is that the MAC addresses are, have to be learned by each switch individually on the data plane layer. I don't really have the option for real redundancy. If I want to use, have redundancy in layer two, I can run uh, multi chassis ag link aggregation and have the drawbacks there that it only works with specific versions between a single vendor since this is a proprietary stack. I don't have the option to mix and match the vendors there. And um, for scaling, I can't use multiple active links. I only can use the ones yeah, worked with LACP by MLAC, or they are, have to be turned off by, for example, spanning tree protocol. So the conclusion is that there are two networks don't scale. MLAC normally only works between two devices, not more than that. And um, traffic engineering is almost impossible. So I have to use different layers or use different technologies for scaling access networks and connectivity between servers. I can use MPLS. Um, I have the advantage when using MPLS to use hashing, to use active-active paths, to do uh, traffic engineering where different paths for different service classes have the possibility to do fast rerouting and can transport different services or uh, different protocols. Services I can transport via MPLS are point-to-point -point links or plain switched layer two networks. Th this is practically a virtual, big virtual switch. Or I can do VIFs, which results in having multiple independent virtual routers on a router and can this is mostly done by telecommunication providers. Yes. So uh, VPLS is the next step after using plan switches. Uh, I still have data plan learning of the MAC addresses. MAC addresses are not signaled to the other VPLS nodes. So the other nodes have to actually learn where, which MAC address is. Um, I don't have any advantages in 
broadcast or multicast traffic. Um, yeah. And the uh, other part is that all traffic is sent to all other VPLS nodes from the source node when using or when multicast traffic or broadcast traffic comes in. So I have a scaling and tag vector since I have to replicate all traffic. This can also fill my port up. So a different technology is IP Fabrics. Um, the idea is to route everything. I only have Ethernet on point-to-point -point links. All links can be used since we use routing. Um, all links can be used in active mode. I don't have to disable any ports. Yeah. Hashing gives me the possibility to use, um, when the path is equal, to use all links. The, dis the big disadvantage, plain Ethernet transport is not possible, so most customers, most access networks don't work in this setup. Um, they're mostly cheaper than MPLS capable devices. They are, um, yeah. Um, the other advantage of um, IP fabrics is I can use eBGP only setups. I don't have to use an IBGP, no route reflectors, no IGP, and I can keep it very simple. The, route, the switch or the router only has to route. And that's it. They know all IP addresses of all nodes in the network. If the network scales a lot, I can do prefix aggregation or use default routes to my higher switches. So mostly bigger cloud providers use this to interconnect their hypervisors, not directly attach the client to it. And the hypervisor or the Kubernetes bare metal node has to do the separation between the, or for the customers or for the different networks. They are not directly separated in the transport layer. The transport layer only transports everything. So a solution to separate or to give the customer um, Ethernet access or communica Ethernet communication between hosts and not just routed traffic um, is VXLAN. For VXLAN, um, the idea, the additional RFC was that um, I run the VXLAN device on the hypervisor to for and connect the customers through this, through each hypervisor. It uses uh, UDP for compatibility. The idea initially was to use the extra protocol, but not all vendors support easily new protocols. So UDP was, it was decided on to use UDP. Um, when using VLANs, I have to, I can use 4,096 VLANs. Most vendors, even less. Um, with eBPN, I can use 60 million or billion um, VXLAN network identifier, which are comparable to VLANs from the idea. Um, another big advantage is that I can use data plane learning or programmed learning, program mapping. So I can insert the MAC address, or I can insert where which MAC address is find, found. Another advantage of VXLAN is I can use um, multicast routing for the bump traffic. I don't have to replicate it on the source node to every host. And a thing not all vendors correctly do is that the source port of the UDP packet has to be um, should not be always the same. There should be a calculated hash or the inner packet. So VXLAN can use it, but in most cases data plane learning is the standard. The, the disadvantages of data plane learning is that 
all nodes have to learn it, and the information is not transported where what is. So I, if I have multiple devices, and one switch never sees the MAC address of another one, it has to send the first packet to a device on the first switch. It has to use broadcast to send a, or to find the MAC address. So EVPN was f created, or yeah. Um, the disadvantages of EVPN is complexity. So the learning curve is very high in the beginning, especially for setting it up. So the cost is for the EVPN capable switch is a lot higher than a simple layer two switch just because it has to do a lot more, it has to be able to route traffic, and the setup itself costs, because I have to teach all my employees what I, on EVPN. Another disadvantage is that I always have to encapsulate all traffic, and when I encapsulate traffic, I have an IP overhead, and I had an overhead and um, lose a bit of MTU. Most devices can nowadays use MTUs over 9000, so this is just a side note. Data plane technologies, most people use VXLAN for EVPN, but it's also possible to use, um, for example, GNF or MPLS. As the transport, uh, yes, yeah, the transport protocol. Con the control plane has multiple route types, which are all, yeah, communicated over PGP. Uh, I will go into the first steps. Um, the most important one is route type two. That's the, the, the information of the MAC address and IP address is communicated between all nodes in the network or between all connected EVPN nodes so that all nodes in the network know which, where, which IP address is and where which MAC address is, which has the big advantage that I don't have to learn anything anymore. The other advantages that I am capable of to capable to do up and neighbor discovery suppression and can do a proxy up on the local VTAP device. I have less bump traffic and the connection build up is faster. Another big advantage is multi homing for LACP. I can use the built in EVPN features, and um, I'm also capable of connecting LECP to multiple switches and between different vendors. At least in theory, I can do across vendors. It's it's always a fun game to be surprised that it, after a few weeks it just breaks. And um, The other big change is um, that I have a specific communication for multicast routes, for broadcast and for unknown unicast traffic. That's type three routes, and which is comparable new. I have the capability to communicate multicast and multicast um, discovery and IGMP, so I can actually tell oh, the other nodes, hey, this client has joined this multicast group, it has left this group. This is comparable new, but this way I have a lot less bump traffic sent to every node, just to specific ones. And when I combine this with multicast routing, I save a lot of bandwidth, because when the big problem of head-end replication is that my traffic comes in, I have a 10G input, and I have 200 de uh, 20 devices, 
20 other retabs, I would have to replicate this traffic 20 times. So my source would, at le would have to have at least 200 gigabits just for the specific traffic. But in most cases, not all of the VTABs need this traffic or mu this specific multicast traffic, for example, video streams. And um, I can save a lot of bandwidth this way. An additional feature, which is not was not standardized in the first round, in the first RFC, I can announce prefixes. With this, I can decouple the advertisement of an IP prefix from a specific MAC address. I can just tell, or I just can, I can just say, hey, this IP address is reachable on this node, and then the traffic is getting it's getting routed there. Um, this is often used for floating IP addresses, for virtual IP addresses, but also one can use it for inter-subnet routing, for VRFs. Some windows are going away in the back core backbone from MPLS to eVPN with VXLAN and transport even between VRFs or for VRFs the traffic in VXLAN. So, do I want this? It depends. It, it, adds, ex it, it adds complexity. Um, it's normally a lot better than a simple layer 2 switched network or an MLEG network. It has multi vendor support. I can use multiple paths. I can do multi homing in a lot better way. But um, yeah, it has an investment for knowledge, for money. And um, another point is that the problem that hardware switches have limits in their ASIC, and that routing table is not solved by this. If, the, if I have too many MAC addresses or too many IP addresses in my network, I still have issues with um, the limits of that. And um, a lot of companies, like I already said, use this or route the traffic over an IP fabric and use EVP under the hypervisor on the source node. And I have then less limits because switches can still scale there and hypervisors only have their specific EVPN traffic and not the information for all networks just for the sum of them, and also have the advantage that their control plane is a lot bigger than an EVPN switch. I can just have more routes in the memory of a server than on a switch. And that what is it, questions? Uh, so you mentioned um, the varying transports you can use for eVPN? Yes. Um, I would imagine they are not very... I, I mean, some are possibly vendor, cross-vendor compatible, but is that signaled what they want? Um, VXLAN is co normally vendor compatible between multiple vendors, between most vendors nowadays if you use modern versions. Um, if you use it on Juno Plus, you have to use Mac VRFs and not their former solutions for um, yeah, virtual switches. So it's um, you have to use latest versions. Um, versions from 2019 are not recommended at all for your EVPN between different vendors. More questions? No more questions, it seems, so far?
That's a question. Thanks. You've said um, these eVPNs um, are um, difficult for ASICs to handle um, due to limitations of, in hardware. Um, would it make sense more to use servers as um, replacements? It depends. Um, I mean, the, the limits are normally in the 10,000, if not 100,000 of devices. But as a cloud provider, I can run into this issue that I have too many MAC address, IP address mappings. And um, servers have the limitation that they don't have the cap same capacity as a switch. I mean, I can use go in terabits now with switches. Going with more than one terabit on a server is not really possible. But I can route a, use the eVPN on the server directly and switch is route and only and don't have to store less information. So, given that I'm dirt poor, what would be the cheapest way to play with this? The cheapest possibility to play with eVPN would be virtual machines in a lab environment. Um, a lot of vendors have that, but um, there are older switches, for example, from Arista, which do layer 3 only transport. They don't do eVPN yet, but I can do eVPN on a server, even in a yeah, lab environment then. Between the BGP peers, you randomly choose addresses? Or have you statically configured address um, in the underlay network? Between in the underlay network, network, I normally do static IP addresses. OK. Um, I can route the V4 traffic over V6 for communication. So I only have V6 on the interfaces. But this way, I have the, I actually know where what IP address is. And I can debug it on a way easier way. Yeah, it makes debugging and monitoring much easier, yeah, of course. Because yeah. um, unnumbered interfaces have the advantage that it's very simple. I just say, OK, do, be, do BGP on this interface, do BGP uh, on the other interface of the other switch, and they just come magically up. They just have to have different AS numbers, and that's it. It's easier, but it has the disadvantage of not having easy debug capabilities. It's one of the problems we are experiencing at the moment. Yeah. For example, when I want to export our routes with BMP or so, most BMP implementations don't tell me what interface the stuff came from. And then I have to de uh, debug it a lot deeper, dive a lot deeper, and uh, if I no, if I'm knowing, okay, on this interface, this MAC address, uh, this PV6 address is configured, I can just see, okay, on this BGP session, the routes are not coming in. So I guess no more questions and thank you for the talk.